Dank uh, André Knotneres voor dit heldere kijkje in de toekomst van de WRR. Uh, we hebben geprobeerd om van vanmiddag uh, toch uh, enigszins ook een uh, interactieve bijeenkomst te maken. Dus beide sprekers zullen gebruik maken van de stemkastjes die u allemaal op uw stoel uh, heeft gevonden. Uh, het zou aardig zijn als u die uh, nu ook uh, bij u pakt. Uh, we hebben het systeem door en door getest. Dat is overigens nog geen garantie voordat het vlekkeloos uh, gaat werken. Maar we willen nu in ieder geval even testen of, het, uh, of u ook weet hoe het werkt. Dus vandaar dat we een uh, proefvraag uh, zullen doen. Uh, u heeft uh, vijf uh, keuzes. Het gaat over uw smartphone, of u die heeft, of die thuis ligt, of u uitstaat, of u op trillen staat, of dat u per ongeluk vergeten bent om hem uit te zetten. Uh, nou, u kunt, uh, uh, nu mag ik de voting openen. U kunt nu uw keuze maken, wat uh, het geval is. Nou, dat gaat goed. Volgens mij gebeurt er iets raars met de nummertjes. Ik kijk even naar de techniek. Gaat het allemaal goed? Ja, het gaat goed. Nou, ik denk dat u zo langzamerhand uh, allemaal wel uh, een nummertje 1 tot en met 5, 1... 2, 3, 4 of 5 heeft kunnen intoetsen. Dus ik stop het stemmen. Nou, een groot deel van u heeft uh, geen smartphone. Ik zou u dan willen vragen om uw gewone telefoon dan toch wel eventjes uit te zetten. Uh, het behoort tot de weinigen die hem thuis heeft laten liggen. Het merendeel heeft hem gelukkig uitgezet en hij staat op, uh, of staat op trillen. Dank u wel. De, hij mag weer uh, weg, deze testvraag. Het is mij een uh, eer en een genoegen... Om de eerste spreker aan te kondigen, mevrouw Angela Wilkinson, directeur van het Futures Program aan de Smith School of Enterprise and Environment aan de Universiteit van Oxford. Angela Wilkinson verbindt de werelden van de wetenschap en het bedrijfsleven. Ze heeft jarenlang bij Shell gewerkt, alvorens zich vanuit een academische basis met vraagstukken van de toekomst bezig te houden. Angela Wilkinson is gepromoveerd in de natuurkunde. En ze is inmiddels internationaal gezien toonaangevend op het terrein van toekomstverkenning. Zowel vanwege fascinerende scenariostudies als vanwege haar doordachte reflecties over wat zij leren met de toekomst noemt. Ze was onder andere initiatiefnemer van de Oxford scenario's en dat boekje vindt u ook in de map wat u op uw stoel heeft aangetroffen. Roland Kupers, ook verbonden aan de Smith School for, um, of Enterprise and Environment, zal vandaag als uh, co-presenter uh, van Angela optreden. Roland Kupers, van huis uit theoretisch natuurkundige, werkt ruim tien jaar bij Shell in diverse leidinggevende functies op het gebied van strategie, scenario's en duurzame ontwikkeling. Het feit dat hij momenteel zowel aan de Universiteit van Oxford, het Potsdam Instituut voor Klimaatonderzoek, Nijenrode Universiteit en het prestigieuze Sciences Po in Parijs verbonden is, zegt iets over de waarde die in de academische wereld aan zijn kennis en expertise wordt gehecht. We zijn dan ook zeer verheugd dat u bereid bent vanmiddag ook een bijdrage te leveren. Angela Wilkinson, Roland Coopers, the floor is yours. Hello everybody. Good afternoon ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor to be invited to share my thinking around futures with you this afternoon and I would like to thank Professor Knotneros and the rest of the scientific, the members of the Scientific Council for this uh, opportunity. In the next 45 minutes I would like to try and address three questions. First, I want to address the question, if the future is full of uncertainty, what can we do about it? Second, I would like to illustrate what I think is a current misunderstanding about the value of scenarios and scenario work. And to do this, I'll refer to a set of scenarios that we produced last year, which you have a copy of in your pack, called Growth and Health, which look beyond the financial crisis. Roland Coopers, a co-author of these scenarios, will be of a brief version of the first story, and I will tell the second. In the third and final part of my talk, I'd like to offer some deeper reflections about what I see as the challenges and opportunities in realizing our responsibility for the future, whether as parents, as politicians, as citizens, as professionals, the responsibility to shape a better future. So, let me start at the beginning. 
if the future's uncertain, what can we do about it? Oops. Huh. Right. An important quest. We live in turbulent times. Change happens. Societies across the world are facing complex challenges. Yet we still drive forward by looking in the rearview mirror. The future, however, does not lend itself easily to this metaphor of driving. Instead of us driving gently forward into a future that's unfolding in a straight line in front of us, the future is rushing towards us. It's like a motorway sign that moves towards you rather than you moving towards it. It's coming towards us at never increasing speed. And the future landscape through that front window is always changing. Rather than waiting patiently for us to decide what to do, it changes. It pushes into the present, bringing shocks and surprises. Inevitable surprises, the financial crisis, the Gulf of Mexico deep water drilling event, the tsunami in India, the flooding of Pakistan, the flooding in central European cities. All of these surprises were neither prevented nor effectively anticipated despite the availability of increasingly sophisticated futures methods. The challenge of the future, I suggest, is not what we think about the future, but how we think about the future and how we take the opportunity to realize a role for the future in our current actions and decision making. We all know the dangers of driving forward while looking in the rear view mirror, but it seems we, are in, we, are in, we can't stop doing this. We have, in effect, some form of societal addiction to prediction as the only way of moving forward. So what I want to talk about in the rest of my talk is the opportunity that we have to stop, to change our direction, to shift from learning about the future to learning with futures. So not about the future, but learning with futures. I am impressed by her work efforts around the world to gather ever more data and information and develop better models and to convert any form of uncertainty into quantifiable and manageable risk. But I think there is a misconceived concept of the future in these endeavors. Rather than trying to learn more about the future and obsessing which of those futures is going to come about, we need to look at how we think about the future. Responsibility for the future is key to humanity's quests to survive and thrive the next century. From Oxford, Lord Rees, our Astronomer Royal, gives humanity at best 50-50 odds of surviving the next century. I think we can beat those odds, but again, only if we change the way we're harnessing the role of the future. Exercising our responsibility requires us to ask the question, where do we want to take the future? Not only, where will the past take us? We also need to promote better a, a quality about our future's judgment, not about the quality of the information about the future, but about the ways we make judgment about the information and the possibilities of the future. And a good place to start with this is to reflect on the Modern Futures Toolkit. The Modern Futures Toolkit includes many different methods, scenarios, forecasts, models, visioning, but many people are either unaware that there are these different tools, and far fewer are able to use one or more of them. Indeed, many people's futures toolkit comprises of a hammer, whether that hammer is a model or a scenario or a forecast, it's a hammer, and so everything gets a good pounding with the one tool. For example, forecasting is great if patterns and trends continue and don't break. Visioning is useful in helping to decide where society should go. Testing preferred visions of the future using plausible scenarios can, however, help dreaming to become more realistic. Research and education on futures is essential. And from, a, from the UK, I admire many of the efforts that go on in the Netherlands about promoting scholarship around futures. 
This is easier said than achieved in many other places. So whilst the notion is that histor history and historical studies are well accepted in scholarship terms, as a future scholar, quite often I'm treated with derision or suspicion because speculation is not something that a sensible young woman should be doing. But, it, but future scholarship and futures research is essential because the influence of futures assumption, of assumptions in the present cannot be dismissed or denied. They are real and they have a real impact. So to realize the responsibility for the future, we can either go on naively, relying on the promises of prediction and the power of dreaming, or we can realize that responsibility by learning how better to harness the futures toolkit and put it to better use. And to do that, we need futures education to build a what more widespread literacy around futures and to enable people to take the responsibility to shape the future in a meaningful way. Of the modern futures toolkits, one of the most misunderstood tools, I think, is scenarios. Scenarios are often confused or misunderstood as other types of futures method. But scenarios are not projections or forecasts. They are not various runs of a computer-based model or a spreadsheet. They are not visions, not designed to be good or bad stories of the future to, or to reflect preferences or prescriptions. Scenarios offer a value that is different to other futures methods but is often not realized in their practice. They provide a way of looking at the inherent assumptions about the future and the past that shape our perception of current reality. They provide a means to test and improve the quality of our judgment. They help us to test the future of today's decisions. So I want to invite you to think of scenarios not as another form of probability analysis or prediction or forecasting, but as um, different pairs of eyeglasses that you can put on and see the world anew. A pair of spectacles that you can take on and off and think about what does the present situation look like from different perspectives of the future. The Netherlands has a tradition of using scenarios to think about the long term. You have many decades of experience in building scenarios and using scenarios to make really big decisions. For example, committing 150 billion euros over the, in the next 25 years on sea defences shows a degree of anticipatory thinking with respect to climate change. This demonstrates how the Netherlands is using scenarios in policy making to prepare itself for the future we will in inherit from the past. In a similar way, in the run-up to the financial crisis, individual banks and some regulators were also using scenarios to stress test their activities, aiming to protect their firms from surprises in the future. Banks populated the fat tail distributions of their quantitative risk analysis with specific events based on things that had happened in the past. One of the scenarios developed by the UK Financial Services Regulatory Authority even outlined the possibility of a collapse of a major bank, a black rock type event. But this scenario was dismissed as too improbable and taken off the table. What this point illustrates is that the real value of scenarios lies not in their promise as another form of probability analysis, but in their use in thinking through less familiar and more uncomfortable questions of what if. It requires courage to look at what might be coming at us from the future that is less familiar and that points to unconventional or inconvenient truths. And then the scenarios that Roland and I will share with you we won't, we're going to encourage you to think of them as different pairs of spectacles for looking at the deeply held assumptions and deeply incorrect assumptions that have been made about the financial system. Our Beyond the Financial Crisis Scenario Project started off as a voluntary initiative, um, following on from the second Oxford Futures Forum. We exchanged ideas and increasingly found ourselves looking at the using this financial crisis as a point of reference. We noticed that the system had become, in effect, blind to change in the pursuit of ever greater returns. In effect, just like Wiley Coyote in this cartoon, the whole system ran itself off a cliff. 
the foundations that it was built on didn't provide any underpinning support. But let's hope that, like Wiley Coyote, there isn't some great big boulder still waiting to come and fall on our head. Our initial work led us to ask a whole series of questions. How had we all become complicit for decades in maintaining and sustaining the belief in a world of easier and cheaper credit and the pursuit of unlimited growth? Why were early warnings ignored about the financial crisis? Warnings even from people such as Warren Buffett and his statement about derivatives as financial weapons of mass destruction. These were overlooked from many different sources. Why were many more people not concerned about the divergence between inbuilt mainstream economic assumptions and the realities of behaviors in the real world? And why were so many pr risk professions and experts unintentionally promoting a misunderstanding of risk and uncertainty and uh, an attention to better analysis rather than better judgment? We didn't set out to build a set of scenarios, but we found that we all agreed that maybe the scenarios were the best way to share what we had come to see for ourselves. So this, in this slide, this is what the world was looked like at the time that we started building these scenarios. In the Netherlands, both the Netherlands and the UK had embraced the promises of ICESAVE with a vengeance under central bank approval. At the threshold of the crisis, ABN AMBRO was taken over and taken apart by a consortium of RBS, Santander, and Fortis. The subsequent collapse destroyed one of the banks and led to nationalization of the other amid a great, great anger at the scandal. Bankers' bonuses created an embarrassment of riches, gained privately at the expense of the public. And ironically for the Netherlands, with its uniquely fully funded pension system, you found your exposed self exposed to more market risk than any other country. The financial crisis, in turn, started to bring to light tensions that existed under the surface of society, questions such as, what is the role of banks and the financial system in society? Are institutions such as CIRA capable of resolving tensions such as the pension crisis? Who is accountable for systemic risk? And what is the place of equality in a country grappling for its egalitarian roots? The financial crisis revealed a whole series of deeper symptoms, causes and changes. So before I, we introduce you to these scenarios, let's just take a stock on where we are with opinions in the room today. So I'm going to ask you to pick up your voting devices. And the question I would like to ask is, do you think the crisis is over? If you can vote now. Okay. No. <laughs> okay. When we asked the same question last year at the Global Econom Economic Symposium in Kiel, 50% of the audience voted that the crisis was over. Our starting point in developing these scenarios was to stay with the problem rather than jump to trying to fix a problem that nobody understood. We asked, what sort of crisis is this? What do the different responses to the crisis imply about the futures they will create? There were so many different root causes of the crisis being offered that it wasn't so much a question of uncertainties so much as contradictory certitudes. People offering the fix to the problem without any consideration of the problem. So, in each case, people were pulling apart at a, dif a different part of a complex and a holistic set of changes and challenges, and proposing solutions that didn't fit together and didn't fit, perhaps, the future that's still coming towards us. So, let me now hand you over to Roland, who is going to invite you to put on the first pair of spectacles. So let me now take you to the world of growth. And in the world of growth, we can put on a set of red spectacles to look at the world. 
Um, dit is een wereld waar de kaart getekend is, de horizon duidelijk zichtbaar... en waarin we verondersteld worden dat via de weg van de analyse we weten hoe we moeten handelen. In de wereld van growth, zoals u merkt, wordt ook een andere taal gesproken... dan in de wereld van health die we straks behandelen. Stel, je bent de CEO van een grote financiële instelling. Je kamer ligt uiteraard op de bovenste verdieping van een imposant gebouw. Je kijkt door het raam en je ziet de wereld aan je voeten. Je ziet het leven dat zich daar beneden afspeelt. De complexe verkeersstromen, de wemelende massa. Onvoorspelbaar. Gelukkig is het in je werk anders. Zeker, er waren moeilijke momenten tijdens het hoogtepunt van de crisis. En het is duidelijk dat de marktwerking gefaald heeft op een aantal belangrijke punten. Maar inmiddels zijn we aardig op weg met de reparatie van de marktmechanismen. In de wereld van growth zie je dat de crisis beheerst wordt door actie. Waarbij men bestaande regelgeving versterkt, bestuurssystemen hervormt. In deze toekomst heb je de overtuiging dat op basis van inzichten je ook oplossingen kunt vinden. Kennen is kunnen. Er wordt hard gewerkt om het financiële systeem weer op de rails te krijgen. En ieder land doet dat op zijn eigen wijze. En in de haast van het moment zie je dat landen verwoede pogingen doen om hun eigen systeem op orde te brengen. Maar daarna kijken ze dan toch weer over de grens. In de wereld van growth heeft speculatie een slechte naam. Althans in het begin. De woede over de excessieve bonussen van de bankiers dat gezien wordt als beloning voor slecht management... en de subsidiestromen die naar de banken gaan om ze overeind te houden, is ontzettend groot. En dat is begrijpelijk, maar de woede ebt toch weg. En dan keert het in zich terug dat gecontroleerde speculatie... het beste instrument is voor een efficiënte allocatie van kapitaal. Om uit de recessie te komen, blijven de overheid de banken ondersteunen... en de resultaten zijn niet altijd overtuigend... Veel van deze steun komt de oude economie ten groeie en niet de innovatie in de samenleving. Men houdt vast aan oude wetten, omdat de nieuwe wetten nog niet geschreven zijn. Er ontstaat ook een onmiskenbare machtsstrijd tussen twee financiële centra. Shang Kong enerzijds en Frank York anderzijds, die beide om de beker spelen. Wie bepaalt de nieuwe regels van het financiële spel? Na een periode van economische chaos en snelle afname van de hefboomwerking... zien we dat een aantal landen een beetje op adem komen... en er ook weer wat licht aan de horizon gloort. In de wereld van growth begrijpen beleidsmakers de problemen... en nemen actie vanuit die inzichten. Een goed voorbeeld daarvan is dat nu de structurele problemen... in de pensioenen ook daadwerkelijk aangepakt worden in deze wereld. De struisvogel heft zijn kop uit het zand... Voor de grote crisis bedacht men allerhande financiële instrumenten die de risico's alleen maar uitsmeerden en verstopten. Uiteindelijk bleek dat de bodem van de financiële wereld gemaakt werd uit papkarton en dus ook instorten. Het vertrouwen in de bankaire wereld zakte naar een dieptepunt, de economische motor liep vast. De olie van het kapitalisme was weggelekt en het goedkope geld als sneeuw voor de zon verdwenen. En om de motor weer op te starten ontwerpen... In growth regelgevers en bankiers nieuwe systemen om het verdwenen vertrouwen te herscheppen. In de wereld van growth geloven we dat door meer transparantie en door meer informatie, door gereguleerde financiële producten, we de gebrekkige marktwerking kunnen herstellen. Nieuwe technologieën worden ingezet om betere gegevens te krijgen. En het idee is dat we door die transparantie en die informatie de tools in handen krijgen om het financiële systeem krachtiger te maken. In de wereld van growth is ook aandacht voor alles wat, wat buiten de traditionele groeimachine valt. De tot nu toe externe factoren worden geïntegreerd, binnen en buiten worden als het ware één geheel. Kijk bijvoorbeeld naar klimaatverandering. Dat wordt nu vooral gezien als een bijverschijnsel van gebrekkige marktwerking. Dus in growth krijgen CO2-emissies een echte prijs. U zult zich herinneren dat in het eerste decennium van deze eeuw dat allemaal niet erg veel voorstelde. Nu worden ondernemerschap, technologie en de financiële wereld ingezet om milieuproblemen op te lossen. De handen worden ineengeslagen, terwijl toch iedereen uit eigen belang opereert. En hiermee keert het, het vertrouwen geleidelijk terug. In de wereld van growth is ook een hart. Growth is oog voor onrechtvaardigheid. En er is ook, voor oog, er is oog 
voor de ongelijkheid in sociale verhoudingen. Maar vooral hebben we het institutionele vermogen om ook te handelen en de sociale structuur en verhoudingen te scheppen waar die we ons voornemen. Er zijn veel mogelijkheden voor groei in deze wereld en innovatie leidt ook tot grote bloei. En met alle transparantie en informatie zullen ook de zeepbellen in de toekomst eerder doorgeprikt worden. Maar in de wereld van growth zijn naast de veronderstelde zekerheden toch ook nog een aantal twijfels die aan ons blijven knagen. Is het vertrouwen in transparantie en informatie gerechtvaardigd? Kunnen we eigenlijk wel genoeg weten over de toekomst? Zijn de nieuwe financiële structuren en de nieuwe systemen eigenlijk effectief? En zijn we in staat om nieuwe zeepbellen werkelijk tijdig te doorgronden? Zitten we met de nieuwe groei toch weer op een achtbaan? Kunnen we opnieuw uit de bocht vliegen? Of hebben we nu gelouterd door de crisis een stabieler financieel systeem weten te bouwen? Dat is de wereld van growth. Now I would like to ask you one question before we move on to the next scenario is please pick up your voting machines and tell us whether you think the world of growth is plausible. Now plausible is a very tricky concept. So is it plausible, not probable, not likable, but just plausible? And you can vote now. Yes, 63%. We'll see how you do with the next world. Thank you, Roland. What I would like you to do now, what I would like to do now is I would like you invite you to put on a different pair of spectacles. A yellow pair, a pair we call health. In 2008, before the crisis struck, people were growing increasingly concerned about how a still growing population could fit in a planet where peak oil, peak water, peak soil, peak everything seemed to be rushing at us from the future. This slide shows the front cover of a book that was published by Professor John Adams in the mid-90s. His book was called Risk. There was a big word of risk where our word health is. The black area of the front cover of this book represented the number of pot potentially carcinogenic chemicals. The small yellow square at the top represented the number of chemical carcinogens actually identified. And the tiny little yellow dot at the bottom was the number that were actually regulated. So in this incredible ocean of blackness, we had a tiny little yellow dot of regulated risk. No wonder ordinary people are concerned for their safety. Achieving health rests on prevention rather than cure. If the past of health was better risk management, the future is uncertainty and the search for resilience. In health, before the crisis, feedback within and between systems was increasingly becoming recognized as an important source of order and change. Even before the crisis, societies were beginning to use social media and communications technology to harness the prospects of social feedback. Ordinary people were encour being encouraged to make change happen. This slide shows the potential of feedback in just one very ordinary everyday form, the power of a simple bumper sticker. If you don't like my driving, call my boss. Even the US President, Barack Obama, was harnessing the power of social feedback in his first election campaign, with the innovative shift from $20,000 a plate fundraising dinners to viral marketing of $20 campaign contributions. In health, it's recognized that whilst markets can provide constant feedback on supply and demand and help navigate a more efficient way forward, the markets alone cannot be left to decide where society should go. In health, chat, room debate, chat rooms, TV debates, webinars focus on questions from bankers' bonuses and the appropriate role of finance and banks in society. 
there's widespread concern that the fiscal stimulus packages have done little more than to maintain a terminally ill patient on a life support system and at the public's expense. As the public debates intensify, attention also shifts to the many different linkages between the financial system, real economy, society, and the larger world. A diversity of in financial instruments, instruments starts to come into four, and many new forms of banks start to emerge. New financial instruments, such as social impact bonds, new sources of financing, such as cloud capital, new forms of bank, even the UK Green Investment Bank. Frank Gamble might have told us made, might have made improvisation make look easy for the guitar. The world of health makes improvisation the reality. An increasing number of countries reject solutions that rely on bigger and bigger technology bets. China, castigated as the global environmental lagger during the 1990s, emerges ahead in the so-called so green race. The political light legitimacy of the Chinese state continues to derive from the growth it realizes and the tremendous first mover advantage of more sustainable solutions. In health, the diversity of financial sources and systems starts to reflect the diversity of the real world in which the financial systems are embedded. In the world of health, biological diversity is not just left up to the eco-efficiency of markets. There are models of economy, models as different as Iceland was from India, operating at different scales and with different principles. Institutional diversity is as important as di biological diversity in the world of health. But in the world of health, diversity is not universally fair. In health, addressing inequality remains a key dynamic in any social ecosystem. In health, green is not a color, but a spectrum. Just like the companies shown on this slide, that have managed to reinvent themselves to fit the needs of a changing world, whole societies have to overcome cultural, political, social, and technological inertia and reinvent themselves. In health, we are all sailing uncharted oceans and continuously navigating between the winds of growth and the health of connections. In health, there is greater attention to systems dynamics and network characteristics. Is a network too stable? Does it have the capacity to adapt? Might its present structure amplify a crisis or absorb it? This slide shows the results of a study of the New York Fedwire interbank flows, representing $1.2 trillion of daily transactions. Compare this to a study of electric power grids, and we can ask, can you avoid a brownout by having the right wet network design? To determine whether the connections are really healthy, you need, of course, more than flows and typology. In health, there is attention to the role of social factors, like the wisdom of crowds, the spread of rumors, and behavior effects. But in health, underlying questions remain. Can the media tolerate the resilience rhetoric of policymakers? Can people accept the social changes and tensions that come with sustainability? And in health, do the long-term benefits justify the short-term uncertainties? So, now you've heard, heard the story of health, I'd like you to invite you to a third round of voting. So, is health plausible? You may vote now. Yes. And it's a bigger bar, Roland. <laughs> Thank you. So let's look at both of the scenarios side by side. This slide, this table provides a comparison of, the key, of some of the key dimensions of growth and health. As I mentioned earlier, when we, we built these scenarios, we didn't design them to be good versus bad futures. One of these scenarios is not our preference for the future, and the other one the thing we don't want to happen. They are just different futures, both of them grappling to work out how we will cope 
with a recovery from a crisis and the prospects of the need for greener or different growth in the future. You may find, however, that having heard these stories, you have a preference for one or the other. We all seem to be conditioned to think of the future as a dichotomy, the good versus the bad future. One of my Indian colleagues once commented, perhaps unkindly to me, about what he saw as the poverty of Western imagination to think beyond heaven and hell. I think I can say that in a church. <laughs> if you do have a preference for either, I suggest you take a moment in quiet reflection and ask yourself why, and consider which aspects of the other story you might not be able to hear or see because of this, percept this preference filter. Learning to ask better questions about the role of the future assumptions in the present, I think, can help us avoid the pet pitfalls of premature problem framing. Last year, we published a paper describing these scenarios as canaries in the mind. In coal mining, as you may know, a canary was used to detect if methane gas had been released from a coal mining seam and to, as a forewarning of the possibility of escape of the miners. As long as the bird was alive and singing, the miners knew it was safe to breathe the air. Sadly, recent events in New Zealand show the dangers of coal mining today. In society, the coal miner is a heroic figure, often working at the limits, producing value by persisting with uncomfortable and dangerous situations. Similarly, scenarios are not comfortable ways of thinking about the future if they really have value. They provide a safe way to rehearse the future without triggering a toxic reaction that quickly closes down our minds to new possibilities. Scenarios can help us remain alert to what is inevitable, yet unexpected. So when I asked the question earlier, do you think the crisis was over? Which crisis were you voting for? Was it a crisis of growth and sorting out how to avoid a prolonged 1930s type depression? what someone, some might call the return to normalcy? Or was it that we're in the midst of a paradigm shift where we have to pay attention to more connections between finance, society, and nature? An opportunity to vote again. Which crisis did you vote for? You can vote now. Okay, that's not a bad spread within a room. Both, both two different forms of crisis. The conversations about how to fix it must be wonderful in the Netherlands at the moment. Okay, so let me move on. To, let's wave goodbye to growth and health and let's move on to the third and final part where I would like to offer some deeper reflections about futures thinking. Kant said, Perception without conception is blind, and conception without perception is empty. Simply put, we see what we expect to see. So how do scenarios help train our minds to see the unexpected? How do they help us train our minds to see also what we don't want to see? Our start in producing this set of scenarios was to start with what were the assumptions that were being made about the financial global financial system itself. In the growth and health scenarios, each scenario, in effect, assumes a different type of system. In growth, as shown on the left-hand side of this slide, I think that's the left-hand side, yes. <laughs> in growth, the assumption is that business, nature, and society are separate and independent of each other. That the financial system is separate, separable from the real economy, and that's separable from nature and the rest of society. As a result, it's possible in the world of health to think about those linkages as rather simple and to treat the linkages between these different systems as externalities that can be priced to be incorporated into the financial system. By contrast, in the world of health, these are embedded systems, 
Business, nature, society linkages are multiple. And so the, em the emphasis is also on what are the assumptions about these linkages and what do the linkages assumptions tell us about the problems that we're facing? In health, of course, this diagram could be drawn many different ways by many different communities and people. It's not just one single way of thinking about the system and the linkages. Now, the role of a good set of scenarios is not to determine which form of system is possible, but to provide different platforms for a better quality of strategic conversation. In effect, the scenarios provide different maps to navigate the crisis. As the granddaughter of a Dutch merchant seaman, Cornelius van Willigenberg, I have to say this or my mother won't let me back home afterwards. <laughs> I have always been fascinated by old sea charts and newer maps. But unlike a set of physical maps that, have been, that, have, that are designed to enable a journey from one place of, on Earth to another, scenarios are mental maps that enable us a journey from the past to the future. They're not designed for better accuracy, for, but for enabling better judgment about how the world works. Let me illustrate. In this slide, I'm showing two different projections of the world. One is the Mercator projector, and the other is called Peter's projection. Now, the Mercator projector, which was invented by Gerardus Mercator in 1569, provided a way of mapping a spherical Earth onto a flat piece of paper. And it became the standard map for nautical navigation, enabling ships to travel beyond the sight of land across an open ocean by navigating true north. Now, the Mercator projector, which is the map that we use in everyday life, distorts the shape and size of, ob of larger objects. For example, on this map, Greenland looks larger than South America. The map on the right, the Peters projector, by, by contrast, provides another way of looking at the world. This map depicts the relative sizes of the continents more accurately, but it's not very useful for navigating true north. But you can see just how massive Africa look, appears now. So if you're an airline business, you might want to think about the limits of using the Mercator projector if you're trying to work out what's the most efficient flight path across Africa. So, like any physical set of maps, like both of these maps, even though both are inaccurate, they are somehow useful. And like any physical set of maps, the value of scenarios is in having different maps to hand, not trying to find the most accurate map. Unlike a set of physical maps, the real value in working with scenarios is their role in helping us reveal the assumptions we are making about the future that we might not realize. Sorry. This brings me nicely to the challenge of engaging with uncertainty, and in particular, the form of uncertainty in terms of the social construction of ignorance. The social construction of ignorance, I believe, helps us understand why clear and present signals of danger were ignored in the UK and the Netherlands in the run-up to Ice Save. In 1661, did people in Amsterdam know about Hartman's Catholic Church, Our Lord in the Attic? Of course they did. Of course, the Protestant authorities knew all about the hidden church, but they turned a blind eye, as Amsterdam's policy was to tolerate the diversity of faiths that flourished in the city. However, in other cases, turning a blind eye to what is known creates a much larger problem. The concept of unknowns and unknowables has been around for many decades, and you may recall the former US Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld, mantra on uncertainty. He referred to the what we know, we don't know, uncertainty. The what we know, we don't, what, what we don't know, we know. What we don't know, we know, which I call the social construction of ignorance. And he also referred to what we don't know, we don't know, which are undiscovered or inherently uncertain things. Now, there's an awful lot of exotic fantasy making around the what we don't know, we don't know piece. But I want to focus on the what we don't know, we know, the social construction of ignorance. Addressing it is not easy. It's a byproduct of the efficiency of any form of social or human organization. You can't have one without the other. Efficient organization, social construction of ignorance. Putting it onto the table requires shifting from being comfortable about what we know and can know to having the courage to address things that other people might know but we can't know about here. Experts 
also struggle with this, type, this uncomfortable knowledge and ignorance, and in a way which is beyond the usual criticisms of hubris and arrogance. For example, in the US, doctors invented a new disease with a flourishing scientific literature. The disease was called brittle bone syndrome. It explained why fractures were happening in many children. This disease avoided the need to consider a much, less, much more uncomfortable reality, the reality that some pe parents beat their kids and in the process break their bones. This is a true story, uh, but it's not the only one of its kind. There are some things that are unbearable to think about. We don't want to put them on the table. They can result in the social construction of ignorance. It requires the courage to ask awkward questions. Working from the perspective in the future can give us the safe space in which to ask these questions without fear of intimidation and reprise. It allows us to address the so-called elephants in the room. Scenario-based processes, I believe, can create the open space, the safe space of the future to enable courage, courageous conversations that are needed to address our futures. This includes the courage to look at the pitfalls in sticking with well-established routines and well-practiced tools. Firemen have been known to burn to death in forest fires because they fail to drop their heavy axes, which impedes their escape. You try running with a heavy axe, it's hard. Firemen became experts in dealing with forest fires through training and by learning to recognize the patterns of different fires so that they could anticipate what would happen next. But this capacity for the anticipation based on familiar pattern recognition can impede or prevent the improvisation needed to deal with new situations. A fireman's axe is not only a heavy tool, but a symbol of his identity. It's the last thing to be dropped. In some fires, the reluctance to drop the symbol of the very identity of the expert results in them burning to death. I can't help but think the clinging of the financial analysts to quantitative models and modeling in the run-up to the financial crisis highlights that whole organizations and individual experts can become too identified with their proprietary tools and their professional expertise. After all, what is a modeler without a model? A scenarist without a scenario? A financial analyst without a spreadsheet? We must all learn to drop our heavy tools and work and improvise with lighter tools. Dealing with turbulent change and managing through crisis is about navigating unfamiliar situations, and this requires improvisation. The opportunity is to learn and unlearn with futures. Navigating a world of complexity and complex linkages also requires a new mindset. We must pay attention to how do we relate the different scales that matter. In this world we live in, we have the different scales of geography, of time, and also of meaning. And I am particularly interested in the role that scenarios play in helping relate different scales of meaning. Let me illustrate. I'm sure you're very familiar with this painting by Vermeer. It's a fascinating pa painting. On the back wall of the room, there is one of the new maps of the round world. It's a tapestry. And yet, we, here we have a picture of everyday life going on. And I can imagine the fascinating conversations that were going on between the concept, the scale of the future, the world, and the future that it implied, and what was happening in everyday life as people tried to make sense of what this picture of the world looked like. Today, we're facing a similar situation. Climate change is now a feature of our global map. It's the tapestry that's hanging on the back wall. But while careful surveys, such as those by Globescan, demonstrate a high degree of concern everywhere, people are struggling to develop supportive action at their own scale. So my interest in scenarios stems from their ability to relate different scales, the global scientific scale with the everyday life scale, and create meaning between them. And later, the value, and, sorry, and the value of stories and storytelling processes in this is essential. The process of creating shared stories is how we create these different shared meanings. And too often in Futures work, we focus on the quality of the analysis rather than the quality of the conversation. And later, I know John is going to share with you how he's working in scenarios, which I think is a brilliant way of relating global science and local decision-making. 
So responsibility to the future, finally, also relies on finding ways to navigate between different stances of the world. I started off by saying we, we spend too much predicting the past and asking where might the future take us. This is an adaptive stance to the future. It leads to responses that tend to be centered on protecting and preserving ourselves from the future. We need, in contrast, to be able to also adopt a more activist stance. We need to ask, where will the future take us? And focus then on strategic innovation and creative destruction, unlocking our societies, unlocking technologies and institutions, and finding ways to realize a better future. We should not shirk the responsibility of shaping the future. That the future is not certain and is open to shaping is fundamentally the thing that empowers us to act on behalf of every future generation. So in conclusion, a picture of a turbulent world. Scenarios are one tool in the modern futures toolkit. I believe they offer a way of effectively engaging with uncertainty and in particular navigating the social construction of ignorance. But it requires courage to use them in this way. Scenarios offer an opportunity to learn with futures that contrasts with our tendency to want to learn about the future. Our growth and health scenarios were designed to help us all take a step back and think about the assumptions about the crisis, about the system, rather than just propose more solutions to fix it. The value in using scenarios to consolidate this learning is often not realized. Many more scenarios are built than ever used. I believe future scholarship and education is needed if we are to reduce confusion and misunderstanding about scenarios and make better use of the modern futures toolkit. Let me end with my question. How prepared are you for the many different roads ahead? Thank you for your time.